And with me now in the studio is the Prime Minister, Malcolm Turnbull. Prime Minister, congratulations on your elevation to the position. Thank you. Good evening. Given that you cited 30 poor news polls in a row as the reason for one of the reasons for removing the previous Prime Minister, can we agree that we are never going to hear you on this program as Prime Minister say that the only poll that matters is the one on <laughs> Election Day? <laughs> I've only ever said that, well, I've only ever said that somewhat tongue-in-cheek. You know, it's like one of those uh, um, things that every politician says, well, well, many politicians say, oh, we don't, we don't, don't look at the opinion polls. Nobody looks at opinion polls now we do. with now more we do. attention than, uh, than, uh, than politicians. But, of Excellent. course, I'll you've got to remember that, they're just... They're po a, poll, a single poll is a snapshot in time, but... Well, look, let's start uh, with... Let's start with something more significant than that, yep. which is something very fundamental and go back to mm -hmm. first principles. What are the values and core beliefs that will be the foundation for all of the policies that your government comes up with? Well, th this is a, a liberal national government. It is a free market government. It is committed to ensuring that Australians are free to choose their own uh, uh, directions, whether it's in their business or their profession or their their families. So they've got to so freedom freedom is the freedom is the key the key point. I mean it's a it's a, perhaps a, a bit simplistic but one way you can you can say it you can describe it is that uh, the Liberal Party and I can make the same point about the National Party too, our, our coalition partners, we believe that government's job is to enable you to do your best. Uh, Labor, which has more faith in government, believes that government's job is to tell you what is best. So, so that's that's a fundamental thing. But there are some very key priorities, Lee, right now. Uh, one of them, principally, is we have to ensure that we remain a high-wage, first-world, generous social welfare net economy, and that requires strong economic growth. How do we maintain that? Well, there's a the big expanding global economy with, with uh, you know, many more avenues for Australian services and exports and, and manufacturers and primary products. And all of that's very exciting. So, but we need to be competitive, we need to be productive, we need, above all, to be more innovative. Okay. So, so that is a critically important point on... So, with, with that point mm. then, um, to take the economy against, and I want this discussion to be against that backdrop you've just laid sure. out there, that you, mm. your principles are free market, you know, free individual, yes. um, you know, lean government. Um, would you consider using the mid-year economic forecast in December for a mini-budget? Well, it's it's not something I have considered. The we've only had our first uh, cabinet meet. Cabinet was just only sworn in today, and we've just had our first cabinet meeting. But uh, we're obviously considering, uh, you know, all of our economic responses, and it is it is absolutely critical that we provide uh, strong economic leadership. And you know, above all, confidence. I mean, it's not just the measures. Uh, if you if you talk to Glenn Stevens, the Reserve Bank Governor, and he's and he's, he's this is what he says everywhere, he certainly said it to me in recent times, that one of the missing ingredients at the moment in our economy is confidence. That's to say there isn't enough confidence. So government has to provide uh, the leadership, uh, the, the sense that, that you know, we, we know what we're doing, that we have a vision, we have a clear direction, and that builds up business confidence. I mean, interest rates have never been lower, so it's a fair question to say, why is business not investing more? And the answer is lack of confidence. So everything I can say to inspire confidence is going to help the economy. But even if you, um, you know, have a, an optimistic and a hopeful message about opportunity versus, say, Tony Abbott's message about Labor's debt and deficit legacy and a budget emergency and so on, isn't the reality that you've got exactly the same underlying conditions? You've got anemic growth, you've got stubborn unemployment, you've got increasing demands on government spending, slowing Chinese growth, um, a growing deficit, you know, and so on. So it's what's not, going to happen... Not, I, I but, but I'm you've not got, agreeing with all of that list, by the way. But anyway. Well, you've got... But, so you've got this backdrop of an economy that is not performing at, at top note. So mm. what's going to happen if in six months' time, six months of Prime Minister Malcolm Turnbull, we're still in the same situation, or perhaps the economy may have even worsened by then? Well, Lee, for a start, it, the economy is not in uh, bad shape. Uh, you know, we obviously would like to have stronger economic growth, and that is our... That is our goal to deliver it. But you've got to remember that we had a big mining construction boom. You know, terms of trade doubled. Uh, inevitably, there was, a, there was a great demand for Australian commodities, iron ore and coal in particular. Uh, a lot of investment that fueled up the economy. Mining investment went up to over 8% uh, of the economy. It's normally 
too. Uh, so there was a massive mining construction boom that's come off now. And what is very impressive is the way the economy has reacted. The automatic stabilisers, such as the exchange rate in particular, are providing a lot of cushioning against that shock. Normally, we have a real economic crisis. In the past, we've had, when I say normally, in years past. Yet so still the not system confidence. is working. Well, I think that is, there, there are many explanations for that. But one of the things I can do as Prime Minister and my government can do is to provide the leadership and the confidence. And you do that not by just talking in an, you know, in an airy fairy way. You've got to actually lay out the facts. You've got to describe the situation as it stands. And so... Well, you've got to introduce mm, some reforms. Yes, indeed. So on that uh, point, let me ask mm. you, will you consider expanding the base and the rate of the GST? Well, we're considering tax reform is going to be a big part of our reform agenda going forward. That's why we've brought the tax minister, the assistant treasurer, Kelly O'Dwyer, into the cabinet. And is everything on the table? Well, all I, I'm not going to rule things in or rule things out. This is This is one of the... This is one of the Canberra games. One of the things I'm trying to do is to change the paradigm so that it's a more rational one, you know, because you get into this uh, crazy situation where politicians are, uh, you know, backed up by journalists or their opponents say, rule this in, rule that out, rule this in, rule that out, or they're, they're asked to say, will you guarantee that this policy will work? And the truth of the matter is that when you're considering reform, you've got to be prepared to consider... Um, all of the advice that you receive. I mean, there's clearly there are practical limits as to what you would do, but the important thing is to be open-minded, consult, engage intelligently, in explain the challenges to the public in a manner that respects their intelligence, and then make a decision. And having made a decision, then, ex then argue, advocate, in other words, why your decision is right. On the point you make about confidence, one of the things that has perhaps stymied business confidence is industrial relations, and they have been wanting small business and large businesses industrial relations reform. Mm. You said in 2011, after Qantas grounded its fleet, that there should be maximum freedom and flexibility in the workplace. That also fits with the core mm. principles you outlined before. Mm. I don't think we should be frightened by the work choices bogey. Given that, what then is your first priority in industrial relations reform? Well, the the the, the the industrial relations reform, which is basically you know, labour market reform, uh, is a has been a very vexed one. It's been a uh, you know it's, it's obviously been a, a pitch battle in some respects between uh, the government and the unions and business and the unions. I think the important thing is to seek to explore ways in which we can achieve more flexibility. Uh, higher levels of employment, higher levels of business activity, and do so in a way that reassures. Australians, Australian workers in particular, that this is not threatening their conditions. You know, in other words, in other words, a the challenge for us is not to wage war with unions or or the workers that they that they seek to represent, but really to explain what the challenges are and then lay out some some reform options. Now, you know, as to specifics, well, we're a cabinet government, so specific policies will be resolved by the Cabinet, uh, and in any event, we're only, we're barely a week old. Let's turn to foreign and defence policy. What do you currently consider to be the greatest threat to global security? Well, look, there are, it, you probably can't really, you can't really rank them because they are very difficult. I mean, the, the, clearly the threat of terrorism, uh, the, uh, if you like, militant Islamist uh, terrorist groups like um, Daesh in the Middle East, and it's you know various affiliates around the world, um, Al Qaeda. Uh, that 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 is clearly a very that's clearly a big threat. I think at a in a terms of our region, uh, what we need to ensure is that the rise of China, uh, which is is happening, it's it's nothing's going to stop that in, in uh, any time soon, is um, if you like conducted in a manner that does not disturb the security uh, and the relative harmony of the region upon which China's prosperity depends. Now, now that requires um, uh, careful diplomacy, it requires balancing, um, and it's, a, it's an issue, as you, as you know, I've taken a very 
uh, key an interest in. And Have you been concerned about, for example, China's um, territorial ambitions in the South China Sea? Yes. I, well, I, I think it's been, and I've said this publicly many times, I think it's been one of the more counterproductive foreign policies undertaken by China. They, uh, If you go back to the um, uh, early 2000s, uh, China took a different approach to uh, border disputes with particularly with Russia is a very good example where they settled outstanding border disputes and and you know just resolved them um, the the pushing the envelope in the South China Sea has had the consequence of exact exactly the reverse consequence of what China would seek to achieve you would think that what China would seek to achieve is um, to create a sufficient feeling of trust and confidence among its neighbours that they no longer felt the need to have the US fleet and a strong US presence uh, in the Western Pacific. Now, what the um, island construction and all of the activity in the South China Sea has done has resulted in the, the smaller countries surrounding that area becoming turning to the United States as a uh, even more than they did before. I mean, Vietnam, for example, which obviously has a, had a very different history of the United States, uh, is now seeking its support. So I think their foreign policy in the South China Sea uh, has been quite counterproductive. And I've so, <clears throat> so sorry. Mm. If you see then, say, the rise of China and how that would be managed as the, the biggest regional uh, mm. issue for security, and then more broadly, you see terrorism. We've got a defence white paper coming out soon. Mm. What is your view then about the role of Australia's defence force and how Australia's defence force needs to be positioned to deal with those sorts of threats? Well, well our defence force has, to, and is this is not, uh, you know, revelationly, our defence forces have to be able to. Uh, play a role in a range of different uh, potential conflict situations, but you know we're not we, we, we're not seeking to um, uh, exact. I don't want to ex you know no one no one least of all the Australian government wants to uh, exacerbate the situations. We have we have very good relations with all of our neighbours, including China, uh, but there clearly are some tensions, uh, you know, with the. Uh, islands in the South China Sea, in particular, with the reefs, I should say, and shoals in the South China Sea. And our own, my own view, and and the government's view, is that the, uh, you know, China would be China would be better advised in its own interests, frankly, uh, to not to be pushing the envelope there. And that is why there's been resistance. Uh, against that activity. All right, let's try to whip around a few other things. Again, sure. against this backdrop of your first mm. principles that you've mm. outlined. Given that you say that you are a believer in the free market, lean mm. government and so on, why do you support sticking with a direct action plan on climate change, which is, is a massive government intervention, mm. rather than a market-based mechanism? Well, look, it, it works, Lee. The, the, the real objective of climate change policy is to cut your emissions. And uh, there are many different roads you can go down. Uh, Why not go down with one, though, that actually matches your first princ principles and is a well, market-based? No, no, but, but <laughs> just hang on. The, the object of climate policy is to reduce your emissions. There are many different ways you can do that. You can do that by regulation. You can do that by putting a, a fixed price on carbon, a carbon tax. You can do it by an emissions trading scheme. You can do it by a series of measures which... Um, you know, people describe as uh, direct action, but in truth, what Greg Hunt has set up is an emissions reduction fund. It's capped. It has been very successful so far. It has reduced its its cut about 47 million tonnes of emissions at a uh, price of less than $14 a tonne. So the, the the fact is that what Greg has designed is a set of measures that uh, he and we are confident will be able to reduce our emissions. To the, at, the, at the rate we're, we're proposing, uh, at a very manageable cost. Now, that's the... So the, the answer is, what's good about the Emissions Reduction Fund and the other mechanisms the government has in place, what's good about them is they're working. So, you know, we're not looking for theoretical or economic uh, theoretical purity here. We're looking for practical measures that work and where there's no doubt that uh, the all of the advice we have suggests that the government's policies will achieve the reductions that have been that we're taking to the Paris Conference of the Parties. As we all know, your first stint as Liberal leader didn't end well. What did you learn from... <laughs> maybe it did now, but what did you learn from that experience that you will do differently this time? I, well, I, I, it, it's, that's a good question. And I, 
there are many things. The answer is I've learnt many, many things. Um, you know, you don't learn a lot from success. Uh, you learn, if you can survive setbacks, and political setbacks are the hardest, because it occurs, you know, in, in the, on the public stage. Um, it is, if you can, if you, if an experience like that, it either makes you or it breaks you. And you can, you can come out of that sort of uh, reforged, um, you know, regalvanized uh, as a wiser, better uh, person. And what uh, are you wiser about? I am, I'm wiser about people. Uh, I'm not. I'm not. A, I'm not great at analysing myself, to be honest. I'm, I don't find myself particularly interesting, so I don't analyse myself. But I feel, I feel much more confident and centred in myself. I feel, but not not in a sort of ebullient way. I just feel quietly confident and settled. I, I, I I'm at peace with myself, and I'm at, and I, I feel that that the leadership I can provide to Australia will make a difference. I believe, I believe the leadership I can provide with my colleagues in this parliament will ensure that we are better able to meet the challenges of the future and take advantage of those opportunities. Let me ask you a bit of a personal question, and I don't mean it to be offensive in any way. Life has dealt... <laughs> that means it probably will be a bit <laughs> Probably offensive. will be a bit. It's a little bit offensive, yeah. Life has dealt you some great cards that mm. few people get, right? You've got a, a great brain, everyone would agree. Um, good parents, good health, um, mm. lovely family, good yeah. education, um, enormous wealth. What do you say to Australians who might think, well, how can Malcolm understand what it is to struggle for anything? Because Malcolm's had everything that he's ever wanted. Well, it's the, the truth is I'm, I have been extraordinarily lucky. I have had to struggle in my life. I, didn't, I wasn't born with a silver spoon in my mouth by any means. But, um, you know, the, the reality is that, that even if you're born with, ability, with brains, you know, with high, a higher intelligence, higher than average intelligence, uh, that is as, in a sense, as undeserved as somebody who inherits a, a billion dollars. Uh, the fact is we've all got to recognise that uh, much of our good fortune is actually good fortune. Of course, you work hard. Look, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was, remember when I was a partner of Goldman Sachs in New York, uh, you know, very successful investment bank, everyone was earning very big money. The chairman, the chief executive of the firm, gave a sort of pep talk to the partners and he said, you know, we're doing well, we're making lots of money because we work hard and we deserve it. And I said to him afterwards, just quietly, I said, you know, there are taxi drivers in this city that work much longer hours than anyone does here, and they don't earn very much at all. So the truth is, we don't really deserve our good fortune. And that's why, if you, are, if you do well, uh, you've got to give something back. You should, that's why I encourage people to be generous. I encourage people, that's why I encourage and, and practice philanthropy. And in terms of understanding the situation of others, all of us are different, right? So the truth is nobody can have experienced exactly the same experience of any other Australian. The important thing is to have the emotional, emotional intelligence and the empathy and the, and the imagination that enables you to walk in somebody else's shoes, to be able to, to, to sit down with them on a train or, you know, on a, in, the, in the street, uh, hear their story and have the imagination to understand how they feel. Emotional intelligence is probably the most important asset for certainly for anyone in my line of work. Well, it's also something that's very relevant close to home for you at the moment because you have 44 people in your own party room who are feeling pretty hurt and angry over Tony Abbott being dumped last week. What do you say to them well, I, in I, terms of... Yeah. No, there is hurt and anger there. Well, no, what no, do you say to them in terms of why they should show you loyalty? Well, Lee, there is... There, look, these leadership tussles always do... You know, there is always some leftover, um, you know, dissatisfaction. But the fact is, we are a... We're a team. And every now and then, there is a difference of opinion as to who should be the leader of the team. Uh, that gets resolved, and then you have to move on. And, and you know, support... You've, the team's got to, co co you know, be cohesive. So I think the, the critical thing is... Uh, 
this just is, is working to together. On. Pardon? They've got to move on. Well, I mean, I, I, I'm not. So, well, I'm not saying that they have got to move on. I, I think the fact is, it is my job, above all, to make sure that everybody, whether they supported me or not, uh, whether they, um, whether they, however, how, however they feel about it, they've, they've got to feel that they are part. We're all part of the the team now. The you know, the, the, the Liberal Party has many flaws, I'm sure, but it has got a couple of great virtues. It is the largest grassroots political movement in Australia. It is not run by any unions or big businesses or factions. It is a big grassroots party. Our party room members do not come from one professional political class like most of Labor's do. They come from every conceivable occupation, as you know. Uh, so we're a very individualistic party. And I think it's, in, it, it, it's also a party with wide ranges of opinions on a range of issues. You know, people talk, it goes from liberal to conservative. The truth is that all of us are a bit liberal and a bit conservative in differing degrees. So the most important thing is respect for your colleagues. Uh, and, and look, you know something? You asked me what I've learnt from my previous incarnation as leader. I think I've learnt, I, I don't think, I know, I've learned to be more respectful uh, and to to recognise more than I used to, um, I've always recognised, but to recognise more than I used to, that uh, there is so much. If there is so much wisdom to be found among others, and that's that is your colleagues, or that is that is you know other people. That's why I'm committed to be extremely consultative, and that and, okay. and by and because you, you you know something. There are very few propositions or ideas that are not improved I'm sorry, by I'm engaging laughing, with others. You're not at the dispatch box and you're not at the bar, so I've got to, got to squeeze in one more one question one more before question. we run out of sorry, time. Sorry, I'm sorry. sorry. Um, I'm sorry right. to be rude like that too. Um, sorry, not being the, rude at all. No, no, I did, I did cut you directly off. Um, That's fine. One quick question before we go. Uh, where do you intend to live in Sydney, in your residence or at Kirribilli? Well, Lucy and I will continue to live, uh, that's to say sleep, in our, in our, in our house in Sydney which, of course, is agreeably close to our grandson. And, uh, but uh, Kirribilli House, as you know, has been used as a, by prime ministers and we'll obviously use that for, um, for official entertaining and it's very valuable. It's a great location to use for charities and for, um, you know, uh, opportunities to, you know, support good causes. So it's, uh, we'll certainly be doing that, but we'll be okay. sleeping at home. We are really out of time now, Prime Minister. Thank you very much for Thanks coming in this evening.